<clears throat> Good to see your smiling faces uh, this evening, and praise the Lord. Um, you know, God, uh, uh, we got this wonderful rain. I mean, boy, did we need it. You know, the scriptures say that uh, God sends his rain on the just and the unjust. And, you know, we're just because of Jesus, and but he's not uh, partial, you know, and praise the Lord. God is good. And um, let's open up in prayer. Uh, we're continuing the study in uh, Luke, the Gospel of Luke, and uh, let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, thank you once again for gathering us together, Lord, here in your house. And uh, anybody that's still on the way, Lord, we just pray that you bring them here safely. Give them traveling mercies, Lord, and, and bless the worship, Lord, and as we lift up you, Lord, in, in our midst. And also the word as it goes forth, Lord, we just pray you would open our hearts to receive, Lord, the word of God, Lord, and the seed, Lord, the good seed. And we just um, thank you for everything you do for us, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we worship.
declare tonight your great love thank you for becoming a person like us God thank you for putting on this flesh and bone and living in this crazy world thank you for not choosing the easy way thank you for laying your life down for us God and raising it up and tonight Lord help us God to want to live for you Lord 
Thank you for your mercy, your grace, and your forgiveness. And tonight, we just honor you. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. Amen. Why don't you greet somebody next to you there? Praise God. The Lord is good. Amen. Um, we have a, a couple of announcements. Our brother Regis is a little horse, so you're going to have to deal with a big horse. <laughs> um, we have a upcoming Christmas event that we're going to be having next Wednesday. So we're sorry for the short notice. But next Wednesday, we're going to be gathering, instead of our normal Wednesday night service, what we're going to be doing is gathering at 6.30 as opposed to 7, and we're going to be watching a movie, The Nativity Story. And it's a, it's a beautiful movie on the birth of Christ. It'll give us the time to come together and just spend time uh, just relaxing here in the house of God, and of course, we have to have hot chocolate and goodies like that. I know there's going to be a sign-up list set out on Sunday if anyone has their uh, special recipe cookies they want to bring and, and uh, pass out here. They're more than welcome to do so. We'll have some other treats and stuff and uh, we'll just relax and, and uh, watch this uh, beautiful story of the birth of Christ. Um, one uh, option you have, I know that uh, some of us maybe aren't as fond of these green chairs for an extended period of time. So if you want to go back and dust off your outdoor church chair that we used to sit out in the front parking lot or the back parking lot, and if you want to bring that with you, you're more than welcome to with a nice cup holder for your, for your beverage of choice. But it, it'll be a good time, so make sure you share that with, uh, with friends, loved ones, anyone who desires to come and be a part. That's next Wednesday at 6.30. I'm sure there's probably other announcements that I may be forgetting. Does that cover it? I think we're good. So with that, if there's uh, if there's any class tonight, I'm not sure if there is. You're you're released to go to class, and like Brother Reed just said, I'll call myself forward. <laughs> we're going to be continuing, and I know we've been in Luke chapter 11. It seems like for quite some time here, but Lord willing, we're gonna we're gonna get through it tonight. By God's help, I mean, there's just so much packed in this, in this chapter that's been a blessing to us. So we want to definitely continue to ex examine the Word of God. We're not, we're not in a race. It's better to go slow and receive than to speed read. I know sometimes as believers we want to be in our Word and we want to be able to say, I read three chapters today, and praise God, that's beautiful. But how much of those did you retain? You're better off reading one chapter or four verses and being able to really retain those than you are a large amount of, of, of the Word of God because we want to really examine it and allow it to affect our lives so we can use it to, to bless others. Amen? Praise God. So on Sunday, we kind of went into a portion of Luke chapter 11. Um, we went through verses uh, 33 through 36 on the lamp uh, of the body being the eye. And uh, I'd like to start our reading in verse 33. Praise God. The Word of God says in Luke chapter 11, verse 33, no one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand, that those who come in may see the light. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when the eye is good, the whole body also is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If you then, <clears throat> excuse me, if then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light, as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. Praise God. So we see that, as we went through before, that as believers we are to receive that light, that light is to be within us, and that light is to shine through us. And there's two ways that we can be in darkness. It's either allowing 
something to hinder the light from coming in, which doesn't allow that light to be within us, or secondary, being in a position where we are blind. And that's those who don't know the Lord. So that light that is in us as believers, it says, if that light as believers is darkness to us, it's how great is that darkness. And as we continue, when Jesus shared these things, as he shared this, and remember he had just spoke of this evil generation, and he shared all these things with them, and he shared they will get no sign. And in verse 37 it begins, and as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him, <laughs> which may sound a little unusual because, well, what a kind-hearted Pharisee. Jesus just said it was a, an evil generation and had put them in their place. And now the Pharisee says, let me invite you to my house and feed you. What a, what a kind-hearted religious leader. Nope. <laughs> he was looking for an opening. He was looking for an avenue in which to catch Jesus. So let's read. It says, again, verse 37, And as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So when he went in and sat to eat, so he went in and sat down to eat. When the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones! Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But rather, uh, but rather give alms of such things that you have, then indeed all things are clean to you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manners of herb and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Verse 43. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like graves which are not seen, and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. Praise God. Let's bow our heads and pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to gather in your name. Father, we thank you for the opportunity just to give you praise and worship and just to, to sit and receive your word, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. We, we ask that, Father, you, again, give us understanding, give us a revelation of what your true word is telling us, and, Father, guide us, Lord. Father, we pray your will be done in each life represented here and the lives at home. Father, you just have your way in this place. We just thank you, with, and we wait with a godly excitement for what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise God. So as I, as I mentioned before, the very kind-hearted Pharisee asked Jesus to come and eat. And I even mentioned on Saturday, um, people have told me that I'm very much like Jesus because when I'm asked to go eat, I go every time too. <laughs> see jesus never he didn't receive all this anger and hatred and know that they want to kill him and they're looking for every reason to attack him and then he gets asked to eat and he said well, i'm not gonna eat in your stinking house i don't want nothing to do with you you're out to get me all the time no jesus didn't answer them with the same anger or hatred that they were actually showing towards him he went in he, he was going to see if there was going to be an opportunity he was going to go and show nothing that he did. Rewind. Nothing that they did to him affected him. Nothing changed him. See, the things that went on in the life of Christ were his choosing. He was in full control at every moment, at every second that he walked the face of this earth, just like right now, he was in full control. Just like those troops that were coming in by night to take him in the garden. And Jesus spoke and they dropped. He just showed the power and authority he had. So he didn't allow the other things because what well, people treated me mean, so I'm going to treat them mean. I'm going to act the same way towards them. He didn't allow his circumstances to change who he was. He was Christ and he was going to be that. So it says that he was invited, so he went. And it says... So he went in and sat down to eat. 
And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. So that Pharisee was probably like, aha. <laughs> he was probably, I got him. I knew we could trick him. I knew we could catch him. You know, uh, he was having this nice, quaint little dinner uh, that he invited Jesus to, that he just happened to have invited his lawyers, the lawyers that were there too. Most most of the time, if you get invited to dinner and someone brings lawyers with them, you, you might want to be careful. <laughs> there may be ul ulterior motives behind that. But it says that he didn't wash before dinner. But it's an understanding of what that means, that he didn't wash. It was not washing like we think. Like, no, 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 don't sit down, mijo. Go, ahead, go wash your hands and then come back and sit at the table. Jesus wasn't patted on the head in any way. This was a ceremonial washing that they were talking about. And this ceremonial washing was looked on by these Pharisees and these religious leaders in the same, at the same level as fornication. They said, if you don't, do this ceremonial washing before you eat, it's the same as committing fornication. That's, that's the level of offense that they saw this at. Uh, they, they, there were some other terms that were mentioned that we really don't need to go into, but they saw it in a, in a very bad way, in a very bad way. So when Jesus didn't do this, that must have set off every flag and whistle and everything else for these religious leaders. But this actual event... Uh, let me give you a little background on how it goes. It was actually a special stone vessel that they kept ceremonially clean water in that they had to uh, have a specific amount. I think that the, the, the amount was uh, uh, an egg and a half full was the initial pour. And this pour was ha had to be pouring, poured in a certain way. The water started to be poured on the fingertips, down towards the hand, and dripped off the wrist. So as they poured this, it went down the wrist. Now after that was done, they made a fist, and they washed this palm, washed this palm, then put their hands down, then the water was poured again ceremonially, special, special clean water. Now it was poured from the wrist and dripped down the fingers. So this had to be done in that manner, and then now they were ready for surgery. <laughs> well, now they were ready to eat their food, okay? The, the strict religious Jew would do that between each meal. Oh, they just had their first portion of meal, their hummus, okay? Okay, get the, get the rock of water out, it's time to do it again. And each time they would do it between each portion of the meal. This is what they're talking about Jesus not doing. See, this was something that was implemented by the religious leaders. So this ceremonial washing was put in place, and Jesus did not follow after what they had expected him to do. So let's continue. It says, "Now the now when when uh, he had not finished, he had not first washed before dinner." Verse thirty-nine. And the Lord said to him, so it, it doesn't even give an opportunity for this religious Pharisee or anyone else that's there to even say anything to Jesus. Jesus already knew. And he just reacts to them. It says, then the Lord said to him, because it said the Pharisee marveled. I don't know if that meant he went like, <gasps> <laughs> what he saw what he, when he saw, he didn't break out the rock and you know he didn't do these things this certain way he i don't know what what marveled meant at that particular but jesus jesus told him says now the lord said to him now you pharisees make the outside of the cup and dish clean but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness foolish ones and when you see an exclamation point it means there's an exclamation point there. <laughs> Just like when we have one, when we say something with an exclamation point. He was making a point when he said this, foolish ones. Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? 
but rather give alms as such things that you have, then indeed all things are clean to you. So he said, didn't the same God that made the outside that you're so concerned with make the inside as well? It says you're so concerned with giving the alms and and you think if you give the proper amounts and you do the things physically, then you're clean. It says then indeed all things are clean if you do those things. And then we get to verse 42 where it is the woe. There's six woes. There's three woes for the Pharisees and there's three woes for the lawyers. So 42. But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manners of herb. So what it's speaking of is even the smallest amount that they had gained. Okay, they had an herb garden. They planted something. And even of that smallest amount, they had their tea leaves or their herb garden. And they said, okay, then we have these uh, 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 10, 10 little leaves. Okay, then one of them goes to the Lord. And then these nine are mine. And then they give their 10. And they made sure specifically every detail, every I was dotted, every T was crossed, being legalistic in their religious beliefs, they said, this is mandatory. But they thought that was all they needed. They thought that they could do in the physical. They could earn what they needed to do to be righteous. Because he says you do these things and pass by justice and the love of God. Justice and the love of God are the most, these things are the most important portions of what God has called us to do, or what he desires for us to do with our lives. It, 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 what, what's, what, what he requires of us, I should say. Um, I'm blanking on it. It was right there. But I know it's, Oh, that was so close. <laughs> I know if I if I say the number, you'll know the scripture. It is six eight. And that's it. Ding 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 ding. Give that man a prize. Um, Micah six eight. He has shown thee. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what the Lord requires of thee. <laughs> we would sing that song. And what is it? But to do justly, justice. And to love mercy. And to walk humbly with thy God. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. You're ignoring all that. But you're giving your little tea leaves. And you're giving your little herbs. And you're giving all of the smallest portions. That means they were giving of the bigger portions as well. But... He said, you're so concerned with these little things that you're ignoring everything, the big things. But what else does he say? Because a lot of people think giving is Old Testament. Giving and, 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 and an offering and, and the actual tithing is something that should be gone and done away with because that's all Old Testament law and we live uh, in, the, in, the, in the New Covenant but what does Jesus say? He says, these you ought to have done, meaning you should be giving. You should be giving. Without leaving the others undone. So you should be showing justice and the love of God without leaving undone the giving. Because it's all tied together. The giving is tied together. Now people will have discussions with you over, is it 10%? Well, Old Testament says 10%, but what about the New Testament? Should it be 10%? Should it be 8%? Should you be tithing off of your gross? Should you be tithing off of your net? What about taxes? What about vacation? What if you got a bonus? Now you're being legalistic about every point. 
What's the difference if you give out of the out of the the leaves of, of the of the nine leaves, the eight? You're giving from your heart. In everything that Jesus spoke of of the Old Testament, he amplified it. Even in the negative. If you have hate in your heart, you've committed murder. If you have lust in your eye, you've committed adultery. All these things that were amplified in the law. So if you wanted to be critical, you could think that, well, then those are the same cases. But I'm getting off base here. That's, that's not what we're discussing. But what I'm saying is, Jesus said, keep them both. You should be doing these things. These are called of us. But more importantly, justice and the love of God is what the Pharisees have, th have thrown to the side. Um, you know that religious people have a tendency not just to think, but to show that there's no point in walking with God unless someone knows about it, other than God. They want to do things and they want to show how much they love God and they're ready to give and do these things if it can be done in the midst of others. It says those religious leaders stood on the corners and they said long prayers loudly. And the longer the prayers, even as they went to the widows, the longer the prayers, the, the bigger the offerings. But they were doing these things as their reward. The word of God says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. It says, that is your reward. You want the pat of men on your back? You want that pat on your back to say, oh, you're doing such a great job? You're such a great man of God? If that's what motivates you, that's religion. That's not a relationship. You do this, you do something out of love. Oh, I... I I want to get my wife flowers because I want to show her I love her, but I, I have to carry it around with me at work all day to show. Yeah, I'm, when I get home, I'm going to give my wife these flowers, you know. It's, they're already starting to wilt because they're dying all day long working with sewer stuff. And but you get the point. I'm sorry I went a little bit, I went a little bit off base. <laughs> but the whole point is when you do something out of love, you're doing it to show your true feeling. You're not doing it so others can see it. Oh, what a great husband you are. What a wonderful guy. Oh, she's so lucky to have you. There's your pat on the back. My wife doesn't like flowers, by the way, anyway, so. <laughs> I, I won't go any further because I'll get in trouble on that one, too. Let's go back to verse 42. It says, uh, excuse me, verse 43. And we'll go to the second woe. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogue and the greetings in the marketplace. See, they want the place of prestige. They want the spotlight. They want to be looked up to, and they want others to lift them up. Have you ever had a conversation with someone and that conversation had nothing to do with you, had nothing to do with anything you were saying, and you felt like that conversation could have happened if you weren't even there? Because that person is just telling you about themselves. And then, I, oh, what'd you do? I did this this weekend, and then I was this, and then, you know what I did? I was trying this, and I've been doing this, and I, I'm really getting good at this, and you know that I've been working out and doing this and that, and they go on for an hour, and you're just like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, like, what do they need me here for? You could put a mirror up here and they could have the same conversation. They don't need me. They don't care if I'm here. They're not saying anything that they're concerned. It's not a two-way conversation. And that's kind of how we can get caught up or when we're, when we're focused on doing things in the wrong light. And that's what it's talking about the Pharisees doing. It's talking about them looking at ways that they can get lifted up. They can get pat on the back. It says they can be greeted in the marketplace. Hey, go, oh, good to see you. Hey, how you doing? Walking around like a celebrity, you know? They're famous. They're famous. Everybody wants to, to greet them and see them. Um, I don't understand that mindset, but people will sacrifice everything to get that. 
whether it's in a career, whether it's uh, uh, in finances, trying to, to build wealth, because people feel like wealth gives them power and authority in this world, and people will look up to them for that. Whatever choice or avenue people will take, they will use different things so that others will look to them as something special. When the focus is going inward, there's, it, it, it's, there's no light inside. When all we're thinking about is what's going to affect us, there's no light inside. It's only, it's only what, what's going to bless us. And you know what's the scariest part about that? Is that's when we're most vulnerable. Because when we're focused only on ourselves, that's when we can truly be knocked down the easiest. Because we start to get the enemy attacking us and, and depression comes when focused to ourselves. Because when we start thinking about how we feel and what affects us and what, when everything is constantly about our own thoughts. And, and when Jesus is sharing these things, he's not sharing it in general. He's speaking directly to men who were supposed men of God. See, they're supposed to be representing God. But all they're doing is lifting themselves up. All they're doing is focusing on themselves. And, and that's why he's calling them, he's calling them all, all these different names. He, he's, he's, he's calling them a hypocrite. As we continue to read. Verse 44. Woe to you in the third. And this one is scribes and Pharisees. He says, hypocrites. You know the word hypocrite means actor or one that wears a mask? A phony, a fake believer. That's what a hypocrite is. Jesus didn't mix words. I believe, honestly, it has exclamation points of what he, uh, uh, right after he said hypocrite. I don't believe Jesus spoke this in anger. But it has an exclamation point. It's saying forcefully. I believe he's saying these things because how this is affecting those around him. How these people are fooling others around them. And as we go further in the, cha in the, in the few verses that we're going to be going through, you'll see... Because it's affecting others in a negative light. Even in the next verse it says, For you are like graves which are not seen. And the men who walk over them are not aware of them. You know what a grave that is not seen? Well, obviously it's a grave you don't see. <laughs> but in Jewish law, if you walked over a grave, even in a, on an accident, I didn't know there was a grave there, ceremonially unclean. You are considered unclean. So, this is something, and that's in Numbers chapter 19, verse 16. You're ceremonially unclean. You have to go through and be clean. You have to be away from the temple so many days. All these things have to come to pass because you accidentally walked over a grave. Jesus is telling them, you're like graves that aren't seen. And men who walk over you aren't aware. You're fooling men to believe you're sharing the right things. You're telling them the right things to do. And what you're doing is you're hindering them. You're pushing them away from God. I think that's why when we see so many times, I don't even want to get started on the subject, but when I start talking about like prosperity teachers and things like that, it gets under my skin because I see it in the same likeness. When, when, when people are writing books and making millions on the best you you can be and living your best life now in Christ and all these, all these things that are focused on you and Jesus wants to bless you and everything is about blessings and finances and money and all these different things that you deserve and all you have to do is ask for those things and you can name them and claim them. And There's nothing biblical about all those things. Did Jesus always talk about, oh, just... You know, just talk, just ask God and he'll give you all these tremendous financial blessings. That's not what Jesus preached. He preached the cross. He said, 
Take up your cross, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. How do you translate that from... I said I wasn't going to get off on the subject, I'm sorry. <laughs> How do you translate that into just ask and, and he'll give you and just name it and say, God's not a genie. That's what they're making him, a genie. Rub the lamp and he'll give you all your wishes. But people buy into it because they want all those things. And I see it in the same likeness. Those are like those graves that people are walking over and they're not even aware of them. It's becoming a hindrance. It's taking them further away from God. But as believers, we can be those unmarked graves. Because if people know that we're believers and they don't see the light of Christ in us, we're going to cause them to be pushed away. Maybe our family members know that we love the Lord. And a certain situation comes up and all of a sudden we get angry or we get upset. And they go, aha, see, I thought you were a Christian. I thought you were supposed to be one of those goody goodies or those hallelujahs. But look, you're just as bad as me. And, and, and you're pushing them away from the things of God. But Jesus is sharing with them hypocrites. Hypocrites. And as he's sharing these things, he gives these three things. Then he hears a voice. It says in verse 45, he hears a voice. This is a, I don't know if you would call him brave or you call him not too bright. <laughs> but Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees. And it says, then one of the lawyers, you know, one of the lawyers, it wasn't just him and a lawyer, it was lawyers. So, so these, these, these scribes, one of these lawyers, answered and said to him, and said to Jesus, Teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us also. You know these things you're saying? You're lumping us in. You're offending us. You're calling us hypocrites. I mean, that... <laughs> what did Jesus say? Oh, you know, really? I take everything back. <laughs> Jesus was giving them truth. See, Jesus never gave anything but truth. And his truth was appropriate for every situation. He didn't sugarcoat anything so people can have a false sense of security. He gave the specific truth what needed to be done. He wants us to look into ourselves, look into our hearts, and know where we stand at all times. So he's not going to give them a half-truth. He's not going to give them a, a soft answer that's not going to bring change. He's telling them exactly what needs to happen. So this, and it says lawyers, okay? We have to understand what that means. These were almost like judges because these, these scribes or these lawyers that were they were translators of the law. People would go to them and say, what does the law say about this specific truth? Uh, 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 and they would get a ruling. Well, the law says this, this, and this, and that's what you have to do. This is what you have to do. And they would even come to the point where they would start to add to the laws. And they started with so many laws, and then it began to get more and more and more and more. And it sounds like I'm not going to get political. It sounds like our government now. <laughs> we'll get one little thing, and then we're going to add 500 other things on top of that. But it says, woe to you. Jesus, this is Jesus answering. The lawyer said, you've, you've offended us. You're lumping us in with those Pharisees and these things that you're saying. In verse 46, and he said, and Jesus said, Woe to you also, lawyers. <laughs> he said, Woe to you, Pharisees. And now you offended us. Well, woe to you too. <laughs> he said, Woe to you also, lawyers. And then he gets specific with them. He says, For you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burden with one of your fingers. See, that's the laws that, that, they're, that they're giving the definitions for. You know, one of the laws is on the Sabbath, they weren't allowed to tie a knot. They weren't allowed to tie a knot because it was work. But if they wanted water from the well and they wanted to tie a knot on the bucket, they couldn't tie it because it was against the law. 
So what was not in the law was you could tie a girdle. So they would get a girdle and they would tie the girdle to the bucket. And the girdle is what I'm saying, a woman's girdle. <laughs> and they would tie that to the bucket and then they would tie that to the rope. They were able to tie it by the law, the girdle, and then they could lower the rope down and get their water with the girdle on there. I don't know, maybe it was stretching further, but it depends on how big the girl was. But that's how they would get water. Um, there's, there's a law that says man on the Sabbath couldn't carry something with his right hand, his left hand, his chest, or on his shoulders. But he could carry something on the back of his hand, on his foot, and on his elbow. And I mean, you get what I'm saying. There's different specific. This is how the laws began to change so much when man just had, had that authority and they continued to go further and further with it. So Jesus is saying, you're putting all these burdens and you don't lift one finger to keep any of these things. So Jesus is telling them, yeah, woe to you too, giving them the same understanding. Let's continue. 47. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your father, for they indeed killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore, the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and the apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute. That's just the prophecy that it's talking about. Those were the things that happened that the blood of all the prophets which were shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. And he says in verse 51, For the blood of Abel, who was the first martyr, to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple. He was martyred in the, in the, in the temple. Now Zechariah in the, in, the, in the Hebrew Bible was the last prophet even Abel to Zechariah is like A to Z, but Abel was the first prophet and Zechariah was the last. And it's saying this will be required of this generation. Verse 52. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You do not enter in yourself, and those who are entering in, you hinder. That is, that is probably the, the most condemning thing that can be said. Not just the fact that you don't receive this key. Jesus is the key. Jesus is the door. He's the entry. He's the entry into heaven. You've received this knowledge. And instead of going in, you do not go in. But now with this knowledge, you even stop others from going in. Now you are accountable for those others who you have hindered. This is a fearful, fearful thing. When I, when I read this, I think... Man, I don't want to be a hindrance to anybody. I don't, want to, I don't want my walk in any way to be a hindrance to somebody who wants to draw close to Christ. And so many people that we run across, even in our workplace, in our daily life, are so empty. They're so broken. They have no understanding who Jesus is. And we as believers have been given this key, this truth, this understanding. And we can be at a point where we're not willing to share it. Where we're not willing to be used by God. And even can become a hindrance by our attitudes and our actions. We're flesh. We're human. We're going to fall short. But we have to truly see the goal that God wants to use us. That we are that, are the, are, are the, are the, are the weapon against the enemy. That God can use us as a tool in his hand to do mighty things. 
And sometimes we don't realize that. Sometimes we don't see it. We just think, yeah, we're Christian, we're going through, we're doing our thing, we go to church, we go home, we go to work, and we just continue. Yeah, we'll take opportunities if they come to us. If someone beats down our door and wants to talk about Jesus, we'll talk with them. Someone comes to us and they're hurting and, and they're broken. Oh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you. <coughs> oh, excuse me. But we have to see the days are dark. The times are short. When we have this opportunity as believers, we need to really see it as such a tremendous blessing. And that's where it goes back to that light being within us. And that's where it goes back to not being focused on self, but being focused on what we can do in the lives of others. Because that's what brings joy. It brings joy to us to be able to be used in the lives of others, to bless others. You know, you could get a gift and really be joyful. Get, be excited and get something good. Out of that, that new car you just got, oh, wow, it's great. I'm happy. I'm excited about it. Five years later, it's a five-year-old car. Not as excited about it. Made a lot of payments on it now. <laughs> it's starting to bleed me dry. This car, I can't afford it no more. <laughs> but you were excited at the moment. But when you're being used in the things of God, these are eternal. And when you speak with someone about the things of God, and they're open, and they want to receive Christ, and you pray that sinner's prayer with them, and you see them going forward and serving God, the joy that it gives you, and the treasures in heaven, the word of God says, and, and, and it glorifies God. These are things that build our spirit and strengthen us and allow us not to be so weighed down in the day that we live in, taking advantage of the, of the opportunity God gives us, and he's prepared us. Right now, the, the harvest is plentiful. I mean, the harvest is people going through tough times. The, the harvest is suffering because they need relief. They need hope. How many people don't have hope? They're looking for hope in every di different direction except up. And we know it. And we can be used. God desires that from us. Let's, let's finish this last verse and we'll be done here. Verse 53. And as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. So obviously it, they didn't see the error of their ways. <laughs> they didn't say, you know what, Jesus, you're right. I need to change. They looked at the flesh and wanted to fight back. We're going to find a way. We're going to find a way to get him. So this is the, this is, this is the, the, the religion at its finest. Empty. Without love. Only dealing with the outside. And so many religions we know are focused on what you do. They're focused on how many doors you knock on. They're focused on how many candles you light and how many saints you pray to. They're focused on how many miles you ride on your bicycle for how many years you have to put into it. So many things are just earned and have to be earned and you can earn your way to heaven. And we're so blessed to understand the truth that the word of God says we can't do anything. Well, it's not a thing that we can do, but it's a free gift that's been given to us and that we can rejoice in it. Amen? Praise God. Let's stand. I'm going to call the musicians forward. And even as we continue here, we're almost to the end of the year. We know that God has many things in store for us in this new year. Many others that God is going to move in their lives and So tonight I ask you, even as we begin, we'll, we'll bow our head and we'll pray and we'll open the altar. I ask you just to see God's face and what he would have for you in this upcoming year. We're going to have opportunities for our leaders to share 
uh, thoughts in their heart, what, what God would have us as a, as a church. And, but I ask each one of you, what do you see for next year? Start seeking God's face. Start asking the Lord what he would have for you to do. Don't go into this new year just thinking, well, 2022. It's hard to believe, but we need to go forward with purpose. Go forward singing and asking God, what are you going to use us for in this year? What do you have for us? How can you use us to glorify your name? And when we start off seeking his face, God's going to guide us. And he's going to use us. He will give us the Holy Spirit. Remember, how much more will he give you the Holy Spirit, you who ask him? Praise God. Let's bow our heads and pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word for his true, Lord. And Father, even right now as we open this altar, I pray, Lord, you minister to your people in a special way. Father, we ask you, Lord, that you would give us wisdom and understanding. Father, even as we are so close to this new year, Father, even as we are even so close to to Christmas Day and a time to maybe spend with unsaved family members and friends, Lord, we ask that you would continue to open doors, that you would prepare us to, to be used as tools in your hand. Help us not to miss the opportunities that you give us, the open doors that you have shown us, Lord. Father, we pray, Lord Jesus, that we would be useful tools in your hand, that you would receive the glory. Father, we are so blessed to be called the children of God. Father, strengthen us and help us to see clearly what you have for us. Bless your people in a mighty way. Touch those who need a touch from you this night. Bless those who may come forward and, and, and just bring their burdens to this, this altar, Lord. And Father, you continue to strengthen and bless those who are at home as well. Those who are going through times of loss with their loved ones, those who are going through times of affliction, you know each one by name. They are valuable in your eyes. Bless them. Help them to feel your loving arms around them. We just give you all thanks and praise, and we just ask, move in this time of prayer. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Praise God. The altar is open. If anybody desires prayer, you, you come forward. The leaders will pray with you.
Hallelujah. The Lord is good. Amen. Praise God. It's a blessing to be here with you tonight. Uh, just a, a reminder, next Wednesday, I know it'll be a little bit different to be here at 6.30 than 7, but a little quick uh, early start so we can get our, our goodies before the movie starts. Remember, you're welcome to bring a chair with you, something to be comfortable with, and we're going to have a blessed time in the Lord. So, praise God. So, why don't we bow our heads and pray? We have a prayer on Saturday morning. Uh, stay connected at 7 o'clock on Friday night. Continue to, to monitor those. And uh, let's bow our heads and pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to gather in your name, Lord. We ask that you would, Father, bless your people in a special way. Lord, we are just humbled and in awe of your goodness, Lord. Father, we are worthy of nothing, and you give us everything, Lord. And Father, even in this special time of the year, Lord, we just ask that you would open doors for us, Lord. Even as we leave this place, Lord, even in our workplaces tomorrow and with our families, Father, you just open doors that we would shine bright for you, Father. That, Father, we would even share the name of Jesus. And, and Father, just be useful tools in your hand. Father, we just glorify your name this night and just rejoice in your goodness. Bless your people in a special way. Again, we thank you. We ask that you would continue to bless all those who are going through so much, Father, in this, even in this uh, tornado, Lord, this, this hurricane that came through. Father, you would help them in all these cleanups. And, and, and Father, we know that, Father, that your hand is upon them, Lord. Father, we've seen you and we know that you are good, Lord. So, Father, continue to strengthen even our country, and we put this in your hands. We just give you all thanks, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Love one another, God's people. Thank you for being with us.